Good morning and welcome to our session on using procalcitonin as an aid for stewardship in COVID infections. Our speakers for today are Natalie Atala, who is a postdoc research fellow in the Mansour lab. She completed her medical training at the University of Beirut in Lebanon, after which she moved to Boston and joined the Mansour lab. She has an interest in research and biomarkers and is the overall coordinator on the multi-center randomized clinical trial, ProSAVE, which studies the use of procalcitonin and stewardship in decreasing antibiotic usage in pneumonia in patients. She wishes to pursue a residency in internal medicine and is interested in infectious disease as a fellowship. Dr. Mansour is a physician scientist who started his research career in the biotech sector and graduated with dual degrees, MD, PhD degrees from Boston University School of Medicine with a research concentration in immune response against invading pathogens. He completed his medical residency at the Mass General Hospital in Boston, where he also served as chief resident before completing the Harvard Combined Infectious Disease Training Program at the MGH and Brigham and Williams Hospital. He joined the MGH ID faculty in 2014 and now attends on the Clinical Transplant Infectious Disease and Immunocompromised Host Service, where he cares for solid and stem cell transplant recipients and those individuals with weakened immune systems. He also directs several COVID-19 clinical trials testing novel treatments for the coronavirus. In addition, he sits on committees for the development and treatment guidelines for patients with COVID-19 infections. So welcome to our session. Great, thank you, Teddy, um, for this wonderful introduction. And it's a real honor to speak with the audience um, about some of our work. Uh, we've set up the talk uh, in a way that um, I'll kick off an introduction uh, to this topic. Um, Dr. Atala will then share with you some preliminary data we have on a retrospective study, and I'll end with some uh, concluding remarks about our clinical trial, which is ongoing and not complete at this time. Uh, and just to let you, uh, just to share with you the structure of the study, and then we should have uh, hopefully plenty of time for questions at the end. So our, our focus today is, is, a pro, is the use of procalcitonin in stewardship. We will touch on pneumonia in general, but we do have a focus uh, on COVID-19 specifically. So here are my disclosures, uh, and none of them are directly pertinent, um, except for number six. Uh, I am the recipient of an unrestricted grant from Thermo Fisher. Um, uh, for the for running the um, multi-site uh, clinical trial that was just mentioned. And since we're talking about procalcitonin, I just want to take a moment and review that this biomarker, uh, which is probably familiar to many in the audience, is FDA approved. Uh, the clinical applications um, are listed here and they include um, approval for risk of assessment and prognosis of critically ill patients on admission to the ICU, uh, the assessment of a 28-day all-cause mortality for patients with sepsis or septic shock, uh, aid in antibiotic therapy decision-making for patients with suspected or confirmed lower respiratory tract infections, which is where our work and research really centers, is on this indication here, as well as the antibiotic discontinuation for patients with suspected or confirmed sepsis. So the outline of this talk um, over the next 45 minutes, uh, the aim is to demonstrate our experience with the currently approved clinical use of PCT in helping differentiate bacterial versus viral lower respiratory tract infections and making appropriate management and antibiotic decision uh, uh, processes. Uh, we have several points that we'll quickly go through. Um, the audience is, I'm sure, incredibly well-versed in these topics, but um, just uh, hear me, we'll go through just a very brief overview of procalcitonin as well as COVID-19. Uh, we'll go into some of the research uh, results 
uh, from a retrospective study that was conducted by Natalie, and she'll uh, share, share this uh, with you. I will introduce you to ProSafe, um, our randomized clinical trial, and then we'll conclude and open for questions. So what, what is procalcitonin? So procalcitonin is a, it's a protein, it's a serum protein biomarker that has had a long history of being able to distinguish bacterial infection from other causes of infection, such as viral infections. Uh, in the absence of inflammation or inflammatory triggers, PCT is typically synthesized by thyroid neuroendocrine cells. But in the setting of inflammation and infection, such as uh, the presence of bacterial mediators, including endotoxin, or the resulting cytokines from immune responses to these pathogens, uh, such as TNF-alpha, IL-1, and IL-6, in the presence of these triggers, you can actually see synthesis and expression of, of procalcitonin from a variety of tissue types. And you see a rapid rise of this marker in the setting of bacterial infection. The counterpart to that is inflammation triggered by viruses tends to not increase PCT. It doesn't elaborate exactly the same cytokines. And so for this biological reason, PCT has been studied and proven to be able to parse apart viral mediated inflammation versus bacterial. PCT itself at the onset of bacterial infection is detectable in as early as three to four hours following infection. It peaks at about six to 12 hours. And if that infection has been treated and is now on the way to recovery, the decay of procalcitonin is about 24 hours. And as we just reviewed, there are several FDA approved indications for the use of procalcitonin. What we have focused on in the rest of this talk is the indication where PCT can be used for de-escalation uh, in lower respiratory tract infection. Just to switch gears and talk about SARS-CoV-2, which we are all familiar with, uh, but just to, just to stage it for, for us, you know, what, what is SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19? So it's a zoonosis. Uh, and a zoonosis means that these are infectious agents that are transmitted to us through an intermediary host. Um, the coronavirus family is actually quite diverse. Um, and so these are all beta coronaviruses. They're single stranded RNA viruses. And there's been several very, very um, impacting members of this family. Back in 2002 in Hong Kong, there was a small epidemic um, of SARS um, that was in 2002, and that was quite limited, but very, it came with a very high mortality. Uh, 10 years later, there was MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, again, a coronavirus where the camelid was the intermediary host. And, and that also uh, was quite limited to the Middle East, uh, Middle East region. Um, and then, of course, we have COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, which has certainly become a global pandemic um, as opposed to the other members. We also need to remember that coronaviruses are part of the normal circulating uh, common cold mix, in addition to rhinoviruses and uh, many other adenoviruses, many other viruses that can result in the common cold. There are a variety of other coronavirus members that simply, um, their impact is simply the common cold uh, presentation. COVID-19 specifically, we now appreciate breaks away from many of the other members because it has uh, what we feel is a multi-stage, really prolonged process. And it's been very humbling to learn and really experience in the care of our patients that COVID-19 not only has a direct viral phase to it, but it seems to also elicit this immune dysfunction. And so there's a, you know, we now feel that there's this incubation period where at the point of exposure, you have several days of pre-symptomatic um, onset where, you know, this virus is really increasing in terms of viral load. You have the clinical presentation of the acute process, 
which can last between five to 10 days. And in, in this phase, most patients will present with fevers, cough, myalgias. Um, so this is the acute phase. And again, at this point, we appreciate that the viral loads measured either by, measured either by respiratory secretion analysis or even by circulating plasma are quite high. So this is a very high viremic phase. These resolve um, at about two weeks. And in a subset of patients, you then trigger this very interesting, and this is a very cutting edge area of research, this immune dysfunction phase. Um, we initially called this a cytokine storm. That is no longer you know, really the belief. It's not a true cytokine storm as like septic shock or, uh, or CRS is with CAR T cell uh, therapy. Uh, this is really more an immune dysfunction, and this can last really for weeks. Uh, and here, patients can experience very serious um, organ and tissue damage, uh, respiratory failure, protracted courses in the ICU, which I'm sure many uh, audience members have experienced with their patients, and, and then recovery. So it's a, it's a very multi-complex, multi-stage disease process. Uh, there's been a lot of data. This is just the one data slide uh, and a schematic slide that just shows us that the cytokine and immune dysfunction is really multi-pronged. It's both innate and adaptive immune responses. Many cytokines have been implicated. Very famously, IL-6 has been implicated. And uh, I led, along with other members uh, here at the Mass General, a clinical trial looking at tocilizumab or the IL-6 receptor blocker in COVID-19 patients. Um, in our hands, in very early patients, this was a negative study. Um, uh, but many cytokines are being studied, many kinase inhibitors downstream of these cytokines are being studied to really ameliorate this immune dysfunction phase. But the cytokines themselves, along with other biomarkers, we quickly learned can actually parse apart those patients who do worse versus those that do better. And these are two little figures taken from uh, a German study and a Chinese study on the right here looking at IL-6, for example, and you could predict those individuals who required mechanical ventilation from a, ver from a, a baseline initial IL-6 serum measurement. Um, and in this curve, uh, blue is alive uh, and red is those individuals who passed away. And again, IL-6 could tell those two patient populations apart. So we quickly understood in this disease there is room for biomarkers to really differentiate those who do well and those who do not. And since many of us have hospitals that are stretched thin with you know, very limited hospital resources, um, this became a very interesting area to me specifically uh, to help us allocate proper resource utilization if we could tell who was going to do worse versus, versus not. What did we experience here in Boston? Uh, we experienced, like many others, a very sharp peak in admissions. Our peak was in April 2020. Um, this is just a, a little uh, excerpt from a daily communication on admissions that was circulating, uh, probably very similar to many of us um, looking at census in our hospitals. We initially, again, like many others, had an incredibly high rate of ICU admissions uh, when our initial approach uh, globally was to intubate rapidly. Um, of course, we've all moved uh, to uh, away from that uh, practice, but we had a massive increase uh, in antimicrobial consumption um, when we could not really tell. And until this day, I will, I will, uh, you know, pose to anyone. It may be a little bit difficult to really parse apart who has a bacterial superinfection versus not. And so we saw a two to three increase in our total antimicrobial consumption during this period. And our COVID patients to till this day really consume quite a, quite a bit of anti antibiotics. Um, several studies began to emerge very rapidly uh, about um, use of biomarkers, clinical epidemiology characterization of patients. And I just have one or two to share, but really the literature now has I mean, hundreds of these reports. But one of these early ones came out of China, looking at just under 1,100 hospitalized patients, where the mortality, we began to appreciate the mortality, which was feared to be in double digits, you know, 
uh, really settles down to about two to 10%, depending where you are. Um, and uh, we began to really appreciate the long-term adverse outcomes, meaning many patients more proceeded on to ARDS and shock. Um, we began to appreciate, as I've mentioned, the common presenting patients, the uh, symptoms, including cough, fever, and fatigue. But it was these early studies that began to shed light. We also began to get some clues about procalcitonin as one of the biomarkers. And I, I know many, many have a panel of biomarkers that they use, and we can discuss that um, at the end. Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, but procalcitonin really started to pop up and we began to appreciate in COVID-19 in patients who are non-severe, um, the, the, the number who had uh, elevated procalcitonin, in this case, greater than 0.5 nanograms per mil, was actually quite low. And it, as a person progressed to severe disease, it did increase, um, certainly, but it, all, it remained quite low. So this, this population became very interesting and we began to ask questions about can PCT really identify this patient population in the absence of bacterial superinfection since their baseline PCT appears to be quite, quite normal. Other studies um, also began to highlight in this Landsat study the question about rates of bacterial superinfection. How worried should we be? Um, and it's a small sample size, but these studies have been repeated and really the answer seems to be quite clear that many patients with COVID-19 will develop secondary bacterial infections. Um, in this study, it was a rate of 10%, but it may range from 10 to maybe single digit percentages, but that bacterial superinfection rate is real. And in fact, a, a more rare population is fungal superinfections as well, is something to, to really um, appreciate. Um, these bacterial superinfected patients had an elevated PCT. So again, in this study, we see that those who developed um, bacterial pneumonias had um, a really a significant rise in their PCT, again, pointing to the fact that COVID-19 early had low PCT, like many viral infections. In the, in the, in the setting of a bacterial superinfection, you can potentially detect that difference because the PCT does go up. So that's uh, the conclusion to part one. Um, I reviewed that procalcitonin can be a very important tool and I'm not doing justice in these initial minutes about the work um, telling bacteria from virus. It has been a very helpful tool uh, in many studies uh, early on in the ED and during hospital stays to identify um, th those bacterial super infections. I've reviewed some background work of our connection between PCT and COVID-19, and this is the impetus for the, the studies we're about to share with you. Um, and so let me at this point uh, pose the question that we decided to take on, which is specifically in the SARS-CoV-2 patient population, just in our center at MGH, can we uh, look back during our peak? And uh, we were measuring PCT here like many others, and go back and ask, did, can procalcitonin serve as a predictor of bacterial superinfection and really assign accurate numbers, how well did it perform, and look at clinical outcomes? So to really, uh, this is being prepared uh, for publication, so we're happy to share some of this. This is all unpublished data. Uh, I'm happy to hand over the stage to Dr. Atala, who led this study, um, and will take you forward through some of the key figures. Uh, thank you everyone for allowing me to present our work. Um, so Dr. Mansour, are you gonna share or should I share my screen? Okay, so as Dr. Mansour said, um, we uh, wanted to study whether PCT levels independently stratify and prognosticate secondary bacterial superinfection uh, and patient outcome in the setting of SARS-CoV-2 infection. 
So we really studied the patients admitted during the peak of COVID at Mass General, and that was during uh, March 17th, 2020, and April 30, uh, 2020. We reviewed 362 records. Uh, our exclusion criteria for patients was if no PCT levels were available during the whole admission, if the patient was presumed positive for SARS-CoV-2, uh, and if there was evidence of extra pulmonary infection, like for example, a positive urinalysis with patients with negative cultures. Any discrepancies were adjudicated by the research team. So as I said, uh, we reviewed 362 patient charts. Uh, 19 patients were excluded because there were no PCT values taken. 14 patients were presumed positive for SARS-CoV-2, and then five patients has, had a positive UA with negative cultures. So we ended up with 324 patient charts that were included in the data analysis. Uh, these patients were separated based on positive cultures and negative cultures. So by negative cultures, we mean that there was no evidence of positive sputum or blood cultures uh, for the duration of hospitalization. There was also no evidence of positive antigen tests for lower respiratory tract infection. Um, and finally, there was no positive molecular testing other than uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so we ended up with 157 patients in the positive cultures and 167 patients in the negative cultures. So furthermore, for the positive cultures, we separated the patients based on whether the medical tre team treated, uh, treated the bacteremia or uh, the secondary bacterial pneumonia. Uh, so 128 patients uh, were deemed to be true positive for, uh, for infection and 29 patients were deemed false positive. So by that, we mean that the medical team uh, thought that it was uh, a contaminant. Like for example, a coagulase negative stuff. So the first, uh, I'm sorry for that. So the first thing that we uh, that we looked at was the baseline patient characteristics. Um, we grouped the patients into two groups. We have the patients who survived uh, by day 28, and then we have the patients who were deceased or who died by day 28. And we see significant differences in the age between the two groups, where the median age for the patients who survived was 59 uh, versus 74. 74.5% uh, for the patients who were deceased by day 28. Other differences that we see were in comorbidities, such as heart failure uh, and COPD or emphysema. So for example, uh, for heart failure, 9.8% of patients had heart failure in the survival group versus 32.8. Then for COPD or emphysema, 8.6% uh, of patients had, had COPD or emphysema in the survival group versus the 29.3. Another important difference that we saw was in, of course, the PCT value, uh, where the mean PCT uh, value for the survival group was 0 0.15, uh, as compared to the diseased group, which was 0 0.32. Uh, another important thing that we thought we should look at was the PCT distribution. Um, so we decided to take into account the positive cultures and to see how PCT was distributed based on uh, the presence of positive cultures. So if we take the uh, FDA approved cutoff, which is 0 0.25, we see that uh, below this uh, cutoff, below 0 0.25, most of the patients had negative cultures. They had no positive cultures, which is in blue. And as we go up and as the PCT values increase, we see that more patients have positive cultures. So the orange increases and the blue decreases. We also wanted to correlate the PCT value with critical uh, microbiology. So on the, on the y-axis, we have the baseline PCT value, which is the procalcitonin taken on day one. Uh, and then on the x-axis, we have um, the cultures. So we separated the patient, uh, we separated cultures based on sputum cultures and blood cultures. So in both, we see that patients who had positive cultures had a higher mean PCT value as compared to uh, patients with negative cultures 
and this is all on day one. And then we have also the culture still day two, which is the accumulation of day one and day two. And we see similar results between both uh, sputum cultures and blood cultures. Uh, so another important thing that we thought we could look at was the Orden scale. So we correlated the procalcitonin value on day one with uh, the ordinal scale and positive uh, or negative microbiology. So an ordinal scale of uh, less than four means that the patient had a less severe course. So the patient was discharged or was only on supplemental oxygen. Versus an ordinal scale uh, of more than four shows that the patient had a more severe course. So the patient was either intubated, went to the ICU, uh, or died. So uh, in both cases we see, so for example, for the ordinal scale of less than four, we see that uh, patients with uh, positive microbiology, which is an orange, had a higher mean PCT value than patients with negative microbiology. Similarly, uh, in patients with a more severe course, we see that patients with positive micro had a higher mean PCT than patients with a negative micro. And we also see that patients with a less severe uh, course of infection have a lower PCT, mean PCT value on day one, as compared to patients with the more severe, uh, with the more severe course of infection. Uh, and this really shows the burden of disease. We wanted to study the diagnostic and prognostic uh, value of procalcitonin. And to do so, we measured the sensitivity and specificity uh, using certain indications like blood cultures uh, and sputum cultures on day one for diagnosis. And then for prognosis, uh, we used blood culture till day two, sputum culture till day two, and the 28-day mortality. So if we take, for example, uh, for the diagnostic value of procalcitonin, the blood cultures on day one, we see that procalcitonin actually performed very well with a sensitivity of 82% and a specificity of 70%. And if we take, for example, blood culture still day two for the prognostic value of PCT, we also see that uh, procalcitonin uh, performs well uh, in predicting uh, positive cultures uh, and bacteremia with a sensitivity of 83% and a specificity of 70%. And we see similar results for sputum cultures and for the 28-day mortality. So we also wanted to compare uh, procalcitonin to other inflammatory biomarkers that were typically taken uh, and used during SARS-CoV-2. So if we look at the panel on, uh, on the left, we see the rock curves uh, for the positive cultures on day one. And uh, in red, we have the procalcitonin. Uh, in other colors, we have the CRP, the D-dimer, the ESR, interleukin-6, and ferritin. So if we look at the curve, we see at the ROC curve, we see that uh, PCT actually performed better than the other biomarkers um, for the positive cultures on day one. And then if we calculate the area under the curve for procalcitonin and the other biomarkers, we get the chart on the right. So we see, for example, that uh, procalcitonin performed uh, the best and was superior to other biomarkers in predicting blood cultures. Uh, with an area under the curve of 0.81. However, for sputum and, uh, sputum and death until day 28, uh, procalcitonin performed very well. It was, it was among the high, highest performing um, biomark biomarkers. However, for the sputum culture, for example, um, we see the interleukin-6 um, had a higher and a superior performance to procalcitonin. But it's also important to note that um, only 40 patients had, had interleukin-6, had IL-6 values. So really the sample size was very small for that. Um, and then for the death until day 28, um, we see, for example, the D-dimer performed slightly better than procalcitonin, but overall procalcitonin had a very high um, performance level uh, when it comes to predicting positive cultures and death. So here we see the Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, we use two PCT cutoffs. So for the panel on the left, we use the PCT cutoff of 0 0.25. 
Um, and then we increase the, the PCT cutoff to 0 0.5. And here we have the patients at risk. So if we look at the panel uh, on the left, we see that um, as the PCT increases to above 0.25, the survival decreases. And uh, it is a significant difference between uh, having a PCT value on day one of less than 0.25 versus a PCT of more than 0.25. But then as we increase the PCT cutoff to 0.5, we see that the gap increases and that it is a more significant uh, difference uh, for, this, for survival uh, as PCT increases. So we see that patients with a PCT of more than 0.5 had a lower, had a significantly lower uh, survival than patients with a cutoff of or with a PCT on day one of less than 0.5. And again, we go back to the same conclusion that this is probably related to, to the disease burden. So if we look visually at, uh, at these graphs, um, so at the top panels, we have the cutoff of 0 0.25. So we have the patients who had a baseline, um, baseline PCT of less than 0.25, and then the patients who had a baseline PCT of more than 0.25. And we try to correlate this with the ordinal scale. So for the ordinal scale, um, as we said, as the ordinal scale number increases, the patients did worse and had a more severe um, disease course. So for example, the green as patient was uh, discharged um, uh, and then the red, the dark red patient, patients died. Um, and so if we just visually look at the PCT values of less than 0.25, and then we compare them with the more than 0.25, we see that here fewer patients died and more patients were discharged. And then as the PCT levels increase, more patients are in the dark crowd, so more patients died, and then uh, less patients were, uh, were discharged. And we see uh, similar results with the PCT cutoff of less than 0.5, and then patients who had PCT on day one of more than 0.5. Uh, and as we said, the ordinal scale really uh, just describes the disease severity. Uh, we also wanted to look at specific outcomes uh, and correlate them with the baseline day one PCT, PCT levels. So on the left panel, uh, we took the outcomes of discharge, the patient was still hospitalized, or the patient was deceased by day one. So this is uh, by day 28, sorry. So this is the, uh, the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, uh, we plotted the PCT values, the baseline PCT values and nanogram per mils. And we see that there was significant difference uh, in uh, procalcitonin levels between the patients who were discharged uh, versus still hospitalized, and then between the patients who were discharged versus deceased. Uh, however, the significant was not uh, the the difference was not as significant between the patients who were still hospitalized at day 28 and the patients who were deceased by uh, by day 28. Uh, however, we see that procalcitonin on day one was able to predict um, patient outcome. Um, and similarly, we also compared the procalcitonin uh, values on day one uh, between patients who uh, were admitted to the ICU and patients who did not need ICU care. So we also see uh, a significant uh, difference between, between both groups where, um, where patients with a higher PCT level on day one ended up being admitted to the ICU. Um, so here we see that as the, so we used four PCT strata, uh, PCT less than 0.1, PCT between 0.1 and 0.25, between 0.25 and 0.5, and more than 0.5. So we have the four PCT strata, and then we compared patients uh, and we studied the days of antimicrobial therapy and how much antibiotics they received based on uh, procalcitonin levels. And we see that uh, that as PCT levels increase, patients were more prone to receiving more antibiotics, which means that they had a more severe uh, course of infection. Um, and this is especially significant between the first two PCT strata. Other correlations that we examined that are not here but will be published was that we try to correlate PCT with time to events. So for example, time to discharge uh, or time to positive cultures um, between patients. And we really had positive results where, where patients with a higher PCT 
uh, had, for example, a lower uh, or less time to positive cultures and their cultures turned positive uh, earlier than patients with a lower PCT value. So the conclusions for that, so what do we conclude? Um, so we can conclude that baseline PCT can stratify COVID-19 infected patients by mortality, ICU level care and disposition. We saw that uh, longer durations of antimicrobial use correlate with baseline PCT levels. And then we also saw that baseline PCT directly correlates with clinical severity scores, including PSI and ordinal scale. Um, and next, Dr. Mansour will, uh, will present the, the randomized clinical trial that we have been, uh, that we have been working on. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Let me go over. Great. And uh, can we, I just get a confirmation? You see my presentation mode? Yeah. Perfect. So, so that was great. So Dr. Atala just really uh, walked us through this very nice analysis of a retrospective study looking at our peak um, COVID-19 uh, admissions. We also appreciate that, you know, that was a retrospective study. Many questions have come up from retrospective studies in the past. Um, and so we actually embarked, um, you know, some time ago on asking a question, really looking at a prospective uh, approach uh, and intervention in reducing antimicrobial usage using biomarkers such as procalcitonin. And it was in the spirit of that question that we um, uh, put together uh, the, pro, the clinical trial PROSAFE, which reads, uh, stands for Procalcitonin Impact on Antibiotic Reduction, Adverse Events, and Avoidable Healthcare Costs, okay, PROSAFE. And so this is an active trial. It's ongoing currently. Uh, so we, we don't have um, you know, data to share with you, but what I would like to show you is some of the structure the basis for the question we're asking, the basis of the trial, um, and we are more than happy to answer some questions uh, about uh, PROSAFE. So our study question uh, is as follows, and it states uh, if procalcitonin in the setting of an antibiotic stewardship program, an ASP, if, if that biomarker with their oversight can decrease antibiotic therapy in patients admitted with pneumonia, and um, again, there's quite a bit of literature on procalcitonin and pneumonia, as I mentioned. Um, I'll just go through two sort of competing thoughts and why we were very excited to have ProSave answer um, this question. Uh, this is now a very classic study. This is a PROHAS study published in JAMA back in 2009. This is largely a multi-center Swiss study uh, that had multiple Swiss hospitals. And this excerpt, this figure excerpt from, from PROHA really, uh, I think, shows the impact of uh, putting patients in a procalcitonin-directed uh, antibiotic usage arm versus standard of care or control. And what you can see is that uh, since inclusion in the study, the amount of patients receiving antibiotic therapy was significantly lower when the antibiotic usage was guided by procalcitonin. Uh, and the safety measures in PROHOSP were, were spectacular. There were really no adverse outcomes. There was no increased rates of resistance by using shorter rates of antibiotics. And so this was a really landmark study that taught us that usage of biomarkers that could reflect disease burden, inflammation, can really help guide um, antibiotic usage and really recover a lot of inappropriate usage of potentially you know, C. diff and other complications from overuse. This um, trial structure was very similar to one that was repeated here in the United States. Uh, and so um, three years ago in 2018, this, the NIH-funded multicenter trial PROACT was published, and MGH was actually a participant in PROACT. And again, here, we want to measure and ask the question, 
can a procalcitonin-guided um, antibiotic therapy for num admitted pneumonia patients also reduce uh, antibiotic consumption compared to usual care or standard of care? And so this is just figure two from the New England Journal article where PROACT was published. Um, and really what you can see is that there was really no major difference where the, the, the average number of days of therapy was about 4.2 days in both of these arms. And so unlike PROHOST, we didn't really see this major difference in antibiotic use reduction. I think several, uh, you know, two major issues, I think, since the publication of PROACT have emerged. One is that um, we, um, in the United States, um, while it's spotty, I don't mean to generalize, but uh, many physicians were not familiar with procalcitonin, its usage. They, uh, we really didn't grow up training, you, you know, in the setting of the use of procalcitonin. So there was one, one um, idea that um, a new biomarker um, was hard to interpret and really um, um, be used to help guide an antibiotic decision-making. The other issue that came up, uh, that has come up in the literature in response to PROACT is that the average duration was of therapy was four. Um, and so there was a lot of question about, you know, looking at se clinical severity indices and that potentially the trial tended to recruit relatively healthier patients. Um, and so we didn't see uh, any positive impact in those patients who may have been slightly older with more comorbidities requiring longer durations of antibiotics to see if, if PCT can actually make an impact in that patient population. So for those two reasons, and these sort of discrepant studies, we want to launch ProSafe and to really address the interpretation and guidance of procalcitonin uh, values, we decided to restructure the study and put those values into a governing body, which is really found in almost every hospital in the United States, and that's an antibiotic stewardship program. At this point, many of the, our ASP program uh, systems were already interpreting value data um, and other metrics and feeding that information back. So in essence, we were just capitalizing on a pre-built system that was designed to help interpret data and feed uh, more expert guidance back to, um, to healthcare teams. Um, so we, you know, there is a literature on ASP impact, of course, on antibiotic usage uh, in pneumonia. This is just a recent study that came out uh, just a, a month ago, a Danish study that again shows us um, a repeated lesson, which is fantastic, which is oversight from a governing body like an antibiotic stewardship program really can lead to reductions. Now in this study, like others, for patients who are a little healthier, the impact was not uh, dramatic. Uh, it was really for patients who are a little more ill um, and really the, the true impact came in the appropriate selection of antibiotic choice. And so ASPs have you know, really shown their power by de-escalating, maybe not completely off antibiotics, but at least from carbapenems, for example, to, self, to other types of self-asporins and agents with a more narrowed spectrum. And I think that's really been a very impactful uh, maneuver to, re to reduce the risk of antibiotic resistance. So in the setting of an ASP, ProSafe uh, feeds it into their decision-making procalcitonin values. And so we, uh, so the study will add PCT to the ASP. The ASP, you know, will then provide more uh, appropriate guidance on antibiotic cessation in patients with pneumonia. So this is, that's our hypothesis, is that by putting these two, uh, by putting these values in the hands of this governing body, we will have very appropriate, impactful recommendations to, to decrease and stop antibiotic usage. And uh, just for reference, for those who are interested, this is our clinicaltrials.gov registration for this, for this trial. The enrollment aims um, are simple and as follows, based on power calculations, looking at the uh, primary and secondary endpoints, which I'll share with you in a second. Uh, we aim to enroll just shy of 1,700 patients in this multi-center trial. Uh, patients are randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion between 
the antibiotic stewardship program, procalcitonin intervention arm, and we will compare that directly with a standard of care arm. The ProSafe uh, study uh, flowchart is as follows. This is, uh, this is our uh, daily um, uh, uh, workflow. Uh, patients present to the emergency department and a decision is made for inpatient admission. So this is an inpatient um, only study, not an outpatient study. Uh, multiple study coordinators uh, will perform a daily screen to identify these patients who have pneumonia and then run them through our eligibility check for inclusion and exclusion criteria. Once eligible, these patients are randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to standard of care versus the PCT intervention arm. Both arms will have procalcitonin levels measured. In the standard of care arm, and these are all sites where PCT is not used routinely, so meaning procalcitonin is not a typical measured marker as part of standard of care, these values are suppressed and recorded. In the intervention arm, these PCT values are then sent to the antibiotic stewardship program where vital signs, microbiology, the values, the PCT values themselves and other radiology and metrics are then assessed. And then a recommendation is made to the medical team. We then follow days of therapy um, and concordance and discordance rates between these recommendations and the final outcome um, decided on by the medical team. To actually perform the screen for all these patients here in the ED, we decided to really um, look through the electronic EMR systems. Uh, many of our sites um, utilize EPIC, uh, and so we performed and, and, and uh, fine-tuned a electronic screen that has a basis within the EPIC platform. And so we were able to make a, a, a simple custom filter where we were searching for admission date, the word pneumonia on and several iterations of that word that would appear on a problem list or the admission diagnosis, or patients who were being prescribed ceftriaxone, azithromycin, or levofloxacin as the three most common antibiotic choices for someone with community-acquired pneumonia. And so once a list of patients are generated from this filter, um, then eligibility um, criteria are then applied and then patients are selected. And when this was compared with manual um, curation of daily admissions to find true pneumonia admissions, this EPIC report tool actually performed nicely with a sensitivity of 75% and a specificity of 83% in identifying patients admitted with true pneumonia or at least pneumonia actively on their problem list. Uh, and so this has become a uh, really nice uh, tool that we'll, you know, we'll uh, be happy to share and discuss uh, for, uh, for finding patients with pneumonia. As I mentioned, there were uh, you know, primary and secondary outcomes for ProSafe. The, our two primary outcomes are a safety outcome. This is a non-inferiority um, outcome compared to standard of care. And so we're looking to see that we don't trigger increased safety metrics, including death, ICU transfer, intubation, uh, readmission, uh, uh, things of that, things of those nature. Um, and our, our second primary outcome is days of antibiotic therapy, where our hypothesis is that we will see a reduction uh, in the hands of the antibiotic stewardship program interpreting these PCT values. We have several additional secondary outcomes including antimicrobial choice. And we put this in specifically as a measure to determine the impact of the ASP, length of stay, ICU length of stay. Um, and there are several others that are listed on the clinical trials registration website uh, and that, you know, you know, and please feel free to, to look through those. And again, this is an actively enrolling trial. So we really don't have any uh, data from the trial to share with you. And we look very much forward to uh, unblinding uh, at some point uh, in the future and sharing these very exciting results with, uh, with the community. So for this part, let me conclude uh, by saying that, you know, ProSave really stemmed from some key 
uh, large trials suggesting that PCT anti for antibiotic reduction is varied. Um, and I reviewed some of the key metrics and variables that have uh, tried to understand why, why that is, um, mainly between European studies, which are largely positive, and then several large uh, US-based studies, which have shown some impact for sure, and others like PROAC, where that impact seems to, uh, to, not, be, to not be present. Um, so ProSAVE is really meant to look at some of the practice habit you know, variables and really address those in a proper randomized trial. Um, so we think that the procalcitonin and other biomarkers and oversight of these biomarkers is a critical variable, variable, and that's why we've chosen the ASP to actually lead that. MGH has a long history of biomarker stewardship, uh, and we've seen very positive impact when there is someone who governs the biomarker usage and interpretation. And so ProSAVE will address these, and we are very much excited to share that with you in the future. Let me end by acknowledging a very large team that has poured hours and hours of work um, into the studies that we've shared with you today. Um, I won't mention everyone's name, but a special thanks to Dr. Atala, who's really been the tip of the spear in leading many of these. Um, and of course, a fantastic team at Thermo Fisher. Um, they've been true collaborators um, and it's been really a, a pleasure this slide is our references, and we're happy to share that with you. Um, we thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you very much for such an interesting talk. Um, we have a couple questions that have been submitted already. If you've not yet entered, asked your question, please feel free to enter it in the Q&A, and I will relate them to Michael and Natalie. So our first question is, what are your thoughts on using, utilizing PCT to aid in the severity of disease in the COVID patients? And do you recommend serial, serial PCT measurements in these patients? Great question. Um, I think, uh, let me answer the serial PCT question um, first. And I think there, there is some data that's emerging where serial PCT um, may be able to parse out those individuals who progress to that inflammatory phase. Um, uh, so so that, that is possible. I think we need some more work and some more data behind that. But I, I, do, I do think at some point, my, you know, my impression is that um, those serial biomarker measurements uh, showing a dynamic range and a kinetic change uh, will eventually be, be shown to be helpful in more appropriate prognostication. Um, I, I'm very impressed with a single baseline PCT as being so helpful in really trying to understand where someone is going to, to land. Um, I, was, I've been, I was very impressed with the retrospective study results and how well uh, a single value even performed in parsing apart patient uh, patient outcomes. Um, I think this really shows us that you know procalcitonin probably has a place to stay in terms of us understanding the, the disease severity burden of a COVID nineteen patient and potentially identifying those who will progress um, and suffer from bacterial superinfection. Um, I think other biomarkers are also very exciting and are coming up on the horizon that may provide adjunctive additional information. So COVID-19, I think, uniquely tells us that there is, a, there, is a, there is space and a spot for good biomarkers that may reflect true immune activation and disease burden. Um, so that's a, that's a great question. Great question. Okay, um, sort of related to that question, your data showed the correlation between PCT levels and antibiotic usage. What role, if any, do you think PCT has in antibiotic stewardship in the COVID patients? Great. Um, I, I think, you know, the retrospective study directly correlated that single baseline value of PCT and um, really showed longer durations of antibiotic therapy. Uh, 
now with a single value. Um, but I think as uh, what Dr. Atala mentioned is that it's really reflecting disease burden. And so if someone presents their PCT is high and you can see that that single, that single window of insight into that disease burden really rolled out what, what ended up being a, a several metrics of uh, more hospital utilization, including more antibiotic therapy. Many of these individuals ended up with much severe orbital scale measures, meaning they required high flow oxygen intubation, ICU level care. Um, so so the, you know, in, the, in the hands of a stewardship program, negative PCTs may be the key, um, the key fork in the road where you can safely say you can really come off um, antibiotics or at least reduce antibiotics or at least reassess the patient rapidly and make those decisions to reduce uh, usage as opposed to someone who has a very high PCT. And, but that's exactly what is rolled into ProSafe. And so in our randomized prospective trial, COVID patients are, in, are being enrolled at the same time. So our hope is with a healthy sample size, we will also have insight into COVID-19 patients and antibiotic stewardship um, with PCT being assessed um, on a serial basis. So in, in ProSave, it's not just a single value that's being measured. Uh, they have PCTs measured uh, several times during their hospitalization. So um, a question that I can answer much better when uh, ProSave concludes, and we'll have very accurate data, hopefully, to um, really answer that properly. Okay, thank you. A question about ProSave. Um, how do you feel that the lack of protocol adherence in the PROACT trial impacted the results, and what are you doing to encourage protocol adherence in the ProSave trial? Great, yeah. Uh, we acknowledge that, yeah, PROACT also sort of suffered from that. And I, I think um, we have measured uh, in pilot phases, starting off with ProSave um, protocol adherence. And uh, Natalie can correct me if I say something wrong, but we have a very good adherence rate, um, close to 80%. And I think when you look at the literature and you look at stewardship trials or procalcitonin trials or other biomarker trials, that adherence rate is actually quite good. Um, I, I think with PROACT, without any oversight and help and interpretation of these values in the setting of your patient, um, I think PROACT you know, witnessed a really a poor adherence rate. I think with ProSave in the setting of a stewardship program, I think our hypothesis will likely be, be true. Um, and I think we'll at least have some really good adherence. So, so far we're, we are measuring great adherence to, um, uh, to ASP recommendations uh, in the setting of these PCT values. And we hope for that reason, that will translate to reduction in antibiotic usage, but hopefully we'll, that data will, will bear true. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do, do you think that the critical cut points of PCT in the COVID patients are the same or different than those patients with LRTI that have been seen in the literature? So do you expect that there's different critical cut points in COVID compared to other LRTI patients? Yep, great, great question. I think we were all wondering that initially, certainly back in, in April, that was a question that we had we would ask each other all the time um, in multidisciplinary discussion groups. Um, I think the retrospective study shows us that the, point, the 0 0.25 cutoff, which is what we would use for a non-COVID patient, really seems to hold true. Um, it was very reassuring. Other studies, smaller studies, have shown that that cutoff also holds true. Um, so I, I personally um, would interpret um, a PCT in the setting of COVID as I would with any other pneumonia at this point. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for such an informative talk. I think that is all the time we have for questions. And again, thank you for, thank you for the talk. Great, thank you so much. Have a great day, uh, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.
Thanks.